Go to the 103rd number of Psalms. Keep your Bibles out. Keep your books handy. Keep your, your notepads, pens, and papers handy because this is going to be an equipping, informing, revelatory, transformational sermon. I'm sorry, lesson. Good morning, class. Let me try it again. Good morning, class. Okay, let me do it like my daddy because I put the fear of the Lord in you. Good morning, class. <laughs> the 103rd number of Psalm, when you found it, say amen. It says, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. Matter of fact, we, 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 we've said this all month, so I want you to read it with me this time. I don't want to read it to you on this time. I want you to read this one with me. Come on, you should even know this by now. Let's say it together. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Woo! Blue Cross Blue Shield don't have nothing on him. <laughs> Let's try that one more time just for posterity's sake. I want to make sure that I get it into your spirit, that it is etched in your mind, that it becomes something that you can recall on any occasion because you will need to remind yourself to bless the Lord. Why do you think so many times throughout the scriptural text it gives us the admonish, admonition, to, uh, the admonishment rather to go ahead and bless him, to praise him, to praise him, bless him, bless him, praise him, rejoice, praise him, bless him. Over and over again, it continually, perpetually reminds you. And that's because if you live in this world, the scripture says you will have tribulation. Okay, let me say it a different way. Trouble is coming to your house. Trouble is coming to your doorstep. It's going to mess with your children. It's going to mess with your mind. It'll, it'll get in your finances and mess with your money. It'll break up your family. Trouble is coming. Trouble is sent by the, 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 the satanic. So the demonic imps are unleashed. And the, the, the devil's his position description is real simple. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. And so in this life, you got to remind yourself that when the enemy does attack you, when the enemy comes in like a flood... God raises a standard against him. When, not if, if the enemy comes in, maybe the enemy will come in. Should the enemy come in? Perhaps if the enemy breaks in. No, no. When, it is a word of inevitability. When the enemy comes against you, like a flood, we read it wrong. We say when the enemy comes in against you, like a flood. No, no. He ain't coming like a flood. He's going to appear as a roaring lion. He's going to emulate a roaring lion. But who's coming like a flood is the standard of God. Who's going to wash away sin? Who's going to wash away Satan's stains? Who's going to what? Who's going to come in like a flood is the standard of God. Okay. We're already teaching, okay? So I'm going to drop this, but I can't push it. I really got to get done with this. But let me make sure that you understand. The reason you can't get excited is because you don't have a complete understanding. Our people perish for lack of... The professor is in today, y'all. So, so, so let me help you out. A standard. A standard is actually a banner. We, we say standard as if it's exclusive to a principle. It is a principle. Our standard is our principle. It is the line that we draw that you do not cross. Are you with me? So what God did was he established a standard. And the other meaning of standard is banner or flag. So when you have a banner or a flag, it is a standard of everything that you, your country, your organization, your ministry, your life, or your family represent. It is the symbol or the symbolic representation of all your principles. Are you with me? So when he says, like a flood, I'll raise up a standard, he is actually saying, I'll raise up a banner or a flag. When the children of Israel were to be assembled and they were about to, to march forward, they assembled them in groups called tribes. Every tribe, go and get with your own tribe. Can you imagine the confusion if there was no order or no standard or no symbol of representation. Because they would know 
where their tribe was. So they lined up with a banner or a flag. Are you with me? And so when they were lined up behind the flag, they found the flag that represented their tribe, which also possessed all of their tribe's traditions and standards. Please, please say amen if you're with me. Just blink if you hear me. <laughs> so when they raised up a banner, they raised up a standard, they raised up a symbol, everybody could identify them. Each tribe would know where their tribe was. So when he says, I'll raise up a standard against you, against him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Please understand what he's saying is, I'll raise up a banner. I'll raise up a symbol. I'll raise up principles. I'll raise up the representation for everything and everybody that is riding with this particular standard banner or flag <sighs> okay I, I'm, I'm really getting ready to mess you up because the standard that we stand behind is Jesus he is our standard our symbol our banner he is our flag he is the representation of all those who consider themselves believers in Christ Jesus are you with me that's why you've heard this all your life and you didn't even understand what it meant. I'll hold up the blood stained. <laughs> you, fight. you didn't even know that that's what you were singing. We got to fight. Although that's real old school. You got to hold up the blood stained banner. Why is it blood stained? Because he gave his life. Because it's stained with the blood of Jesus Christ that purifies, that signifies, that symbolizes, that saves, that sanctifies. It's stained with the blood of Jesus Christ. So when he says, when the enemy comes in, when the enemy comes against you, like a flood, I will raise up Jesus. <laughs> you will have to remind yourself over and over again to bless the Lord. Oh my soul, when he's hitting me with everything that he has, bless the Lord. Oh my soul, and all that is within me. When your children have lost their entire mind and think that they're going to act crazy, bless the Lord. I got to talk to myself, oh my soul. And all oh, when sickness hits your body, when it ransacks your family, and you don't know how in the world, you're bless the Lord. Let me talk to myself, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And just in case you get to a place of complacency, he says it again, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his. Jump over to 1 Thessalonians right quick. Come on, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians, fifth chapter. Verses 16 through 18. I'm going to read it to you from the New King James Version. 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. How if you hear me? Okay, it's, a, it's, it's about five of y'all. That's good. 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. Okay, it says this, real simple. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In some things... In a few things, in the good times, in everything, do what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, according to the New King James Version. But according to King James Version, it says concerning you. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I need your help. You truly are the master teacher. You are the professor. You are master and savior. And so let the spirit of the living God permeate, saturate, satiate our entire existence in this moment. That we might hear clearly that even the ignorance of the enemy, even the lies, even the buffoonery of his efforts would fall 
flat in comparison and in contrast to your truth. In other words, God, kill our ignorance with your truth. It cause us to be resilient. Cause us now to even be equipped so that we might stand in that evil day. That the enemy, when he does come in, we will not lay down our capacity to steal, praise our God, and to tell you thank you. We cancel and bind every distraction, every demonic device that has been launched against our head, heart, and our hearing. We stand now with open arms, open eyes, open ears, and open heart and mind that you might speak truth and cause us to be different. We do not want to leave the same way that we came, but we want to be changed and better in Jesus' name. Have your marvelous and magnificent way. Speak to us and through us and get the glory in Jesus' name. Let everything that has breath shout hallelujah. Don't play with it. Come on, shout hallelujah and amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Let me try it one more time. Good morning, class. Yes, the professor is in. For the last three weeks, we have dealt with this theme. This is the culminating week of this particular topic. But it should never be the culmination of this particular principle or practice in our daily lives. I have been pushing and perpetuating the message which provo provokes hope, which provides healing, and should equip you with empowerment. And very simply, it is to remember who God is and what God has already done. Very simply, we have called this and coined it November 2. Okay, about 10 of y'all been paying attention all month. We, we got a long way to go. Tell your neighbor, don't cheat off my paper. Get it for yourself. This is a November to remember. It is a November to remember. I said it, uh, I think maybe last week or the week before, I said it before that uh, when I first announced that most people look with anticipation that God's going to give you memorable experiences this month. But you thought that it would be new things, new experiences, new favor, new blessings. My prayer is that by this time in the month, you have learned to appreciate all of God's previous favor, previous blessings, previous grace and mercy that he's already extended to you. I have lived finally long enough where it means something to me more than just a colloquial saying of the church jargon that if he never does another thing, he's already done enough. As a matter of fact, he's already been good. He's already been merciful. He's already been kind. He's already been forgiven. I'm looking at you. You look like Lord have mercy. He's already done all of these spectacular and marvelous things, but our tendency is to become complacent in the favor of God and the gifts of God and the grace of God. And we forget not to praise or forget rather to praise him for what he's already done because we're lamenting what he just has not manifested yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it one more time. This is a November to remember. And the first step in all of our lives should be to make sure that we sit down and have a moment of recall. That we remember the blessings or the benefits of God. They are plentiful. They are many. They are vast. That we remember all that God has done to equip us. All that he's done to sustain us. All that he's done to provide for us. All that he's done to protect us. And in the first week, I gave this admonishment. I said, listen, I want everybody to sit down and have a list of remembrance. I want you to sit down and make your list of all the blessings and the favor and the abundance and the, and the breakthroughs and the miracles that God has performed in every decade of your life. Some of you, if you look back to your teenage years, you should be thanking God that you got out. 
Some of you, if you look back in your 20s where you confused and did trying to figure it out, but God kept you and even showed you the way out. Some of you in your 30s when you were trying to work for it, when you were scraping and scrambling and trying to get to where you were trying to go, you should thank God that you didn't die under the weight of the pressure of your own anxiety. I'm trying to preach like you feel it right now. I, 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 some of you need to make sure that you thank God for your 40s because if it hadn't been for the grace of God, God, you would have lost all your complete mind by now and I am now here to testify that in 50 I am fabulous I am fit I am ready I am excited I am incredibly blessed because I know that if God's been good to me like he has back there I can't wait to see what he's about to do in front of me somebody bless God just take a minute and bless God for all of his benefits after you remember after you remember you've got to now tell yourself I need to rehearse <laughs> that's why you make the list so that every blue moon every now and then sometimes even every morning you go back and remind yourself of what God has already done nothing more frustrating than ungrateful children Nothing more, more full of stress, woe, anxiety, and, and, and defeat than having children that do not appreciate all that you've labored to provide. So I can only imagine how God feels when we get beside ourselves and we're complaining about what we don't have and he's trying to show you, do you know what I have been through to make sure that you could have what you did have? Do you know the sacrifices I made for you? Do you know the fights that you didn't even know I had behind closed doors? Do you understand that when they were trying to hold up your blessings in heaven after you had prayed to me diligently that a war broke out among the angels and they were warring because they were trying to get their blessings to you because I answered your prayer it just didn't come quick enough for you to tell me thank you anyway that's why you have to learn how to be a yet praiser which means I'm gonna praise him like it's done because I'm waiting on the earthly to catch up to the heavenly and the punctuation of God's presence to hit my circumstance I will praise Praise him even though I have not seen it yet because it's already done. You got to rehearse what God has already done. You got to remind, you got to check yourself. Say, hey, 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 hey. Uh, uh, life, breath, health, strength, activity of my limb, roof over my head, clothes on my pack, provision food on my table, a way to get there, a car to get there, gas to get there, electricity, I, I, water is running in the household. I, I, I can breathe. I've got air in my lungs. I've got blood in my veins. I got a heart beating in my chest. I've got a pulsating sensation in my wrist. I, I, I've got my right mind. I didn't put my shoes on my hand this morning. I didn't walk out sideways. I, I, the fact that I am here, let me stop complaining about what God hasn't done and let me thank him for what he's already Tell your neighbor you better rehearse it. Talking about what you don't have, what you haven't done, what you haven't seen, what you haven't. You better rehearse what God has already done because it's easy for the enemy to paint a facade and put a picture in front of you and for you to forget the benefits of God. And not only do you need to remember, you also have to rehearse, but the next thing that you need to do is once you rehearse it, once you remember it, you got to respond. <laughs> you got to respond according to what God says. He says, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, blessed to speak well of, to praise, to uplift, 
to magnify, to glorify. You can't make large, God larger than, uh, you can't make him any bigger because he's already vast. He's from eternity to eternity. He is, he is not expandable because he is all being. He is omniscient and omnipresent. He is everything that you need and some. So the one thing that you can do is make him bigger than your problems, bigger than your pain, bigger than your situation, bigger than your circumstance. How do you do that? By speaking well of him, by glorifying him, by declaring his goodness in the earth, by magnifying his name, by making his name great in your life, in your mouth, in your household, among your friends, in your circumstance. You simply lift up the name of Jesus. How do I do that? Wonderful Savior, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Shalom, the God of my peace, Emmanuel, God who is with me. You just start declaring who he is in the earth. My way maker, in case that's too lofty for you, my burden bearer, my heavenly Lord Shara, my way out of no way, my rose of Sharon, my rock in the weary land. I know who he is, my buckler, my shield, my God, my lamp unto my feet, my light unto my pathway, my great I am that I am. My, I wish I had somebody that knew him in here. My doctor in a sick room, my lawyer in a courtroom, my God and my friend in the break room. I need God in the boardroom. He is my God. So you have to respond once you remember and rehearse. And your response should very simply be to lift up, to praise, or to bless the Lord. Oh my soul and all that he is within me. And so, okay, pastor, I got it. It's been a great month. I think I'm ready. I think I've mastered this, this topic, this theme. I've shouted. If you weren't here last week, you missed a good shout. I shouted, I danced, I cried, I prayed, I praised, I learned, I've grown. I'm ready. So, because you're ready, I decided to go back and dust off my teaching certificate and uh, call the professor out of retirement. I even put on a tie in your honor. Not any kind of tie. A bow tie. This ain't no clip on. So, so I did it because now that you are about to commence into the next phase of your journey. Now that you are about to turn the corner out of November and enter into December and eventually into a new year. Now that you're about to embark upon a new phase of your journey, a new, with a new understanding, with new insight, with new knowledge, you carry an exceptional responsibility. Whenever, whenever you, you go into a commencement or whenever you go into a beginning, it, it means that God has seen it fit, seen, it, seen you qualified to graduate you from one, one level and evict you from that level so you don't come back. Come on, somebody. That's why you lost friends because you had outgrown that level of friendship. That's why, that's why some people in your circle are no longer in your circle because you outgrew them in that level of friendship and you didn't have sense enough to see it so he had to evict you. I'm just trying to help you understand the reason behind the betrayal and the letdown and the discouragement and the disappointment. I've learned now, it took me a while, but I've learned now to tell people, God bless you, I love you, and goodbye. So when God gets ready to increase and elevate you, promote you, and graduate you, he has to evict you from this level, but he, he does it with the understanding that every lesson you've learned, every turn of events that you have experienced, all the wisdom, all the insight, all the information that you have accumulated, that you do not hoard it and hold it to yourself. The whole principle of, the God, of God is kingdom. The, whole, the, the main principle, rather, of God is kingdom. Of this world is the kingdom of God. We are members and citizens, not just of the United States, but of the kingdom of God. Are you with me? Which is a higher order, the kingdom of God. And so in that 
process. He has put a system in place for kingdom expansion or kingdom building. And the system goes like this. He teaches me through the power of his Holy Spirit and the circumstantial situations that were guided by his hand because the steps of a good man, a good woman are ordered. That means he commanded you that direction or he allowed you into that direction. And thank God for grace and mercy because they protected you when you went the wrong direction. But either way, all things work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So it still was for your good. So when it came together for your good, and you commenced upon this journey and eventually passed the test and you got to the next level of increase or graduation or your commencement, your beginning of a new season. God gives you this one understanding that the kingdom principle works like this. I'm going to teach you in this process. So I need you to not be stingy and I need you to teach somebody else what I have already taught you. Are y'all with me? That's why he says, go make disciples of men. Teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He gives us this divine commission because our role, our job, is to take what we've learned and teach somebody else. So the one thing I could not afford to do is have jack leg teachers leaving this month. Oh, no, 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 no. You're going to take a test today. You're going to have to pass this class today. Or we're going to have to hold you back for another month. The number one question, this is where I want to begin this process of helping you to understand. You, you remembered or recalled, you rehearsed, you responded, but I don't want you to miss this. You now have responsibility. Do you know how many of us shout and have a good time in God because of our new revelation, because of our transformation, because of our understanding of God and his goodness, and we leave out of here and tell nobody? You, you, you're selfish. Mm-hmm. You, you're stingy. Yeah, How? How dare you? How dare you experience this level of grace, increase, favor, revelation, insight, transformation, and you don't tell nobody else how to get it? You, you don't tell anybody else the way to the, to, the, to the peace that you found? You don't tell anybody how to get to the joy? You literally go quietly into your cubicle and you do your work and hold your head on your desk and you know everybody around you is miserable and you have found the way to joy, to be able to keep going and have a smile on your face even when the enemy is against you? You figured out that God will raise Jesus up against him and the bloodstained banner prevails protects you and prevails against any demonic attack that you you see it's a demonic attack and they come to you and want to dump their information on you and not one time do you even talk about who Jesus is or pray with them in Jesus name so that they can give the credit to whom the credit is due when he turns it around not if when he turns it around and works it in their favor how dare you be this blessed and don't tell nobody how you got there. So, so, so let, me, let me equip you. This is, this, is your, this is your test review. When I was a school teacher and I was teaching high school and, and middle school, junior high, uh, I, we would come time to testing, we get close to the final exam and I would spend, it was a lot of information that they had to accumulate they had to amass and retain. And so I would spend a whole week doing nothing but reviewing everything that we had experienced so that when we get to the final, they would have an opportunity to pass. Because if they did not pass, they did not pass. <laughs> Y'all will get that tomorrow. If you don't pass, then you don't pass. Let me say it a different way. If you don't pass, then you repeat. 
Okay, I'll, I'll say it a different way. If you don't pass, you won't graduate. So we'll see you next year, same condition, same position, same people, all over again. Please tell some people around you, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. Here's your responsibility. The number one question, the number one question that's plaguing man that mankind struggles with, and I've looked in many different resources and found this to be factual or uh, e even in my own research, I found this to be the, the greatest question. Every single year I do a series called You Asked For It. And I position it before the congregation and I give them specific topics that God has allowed me release and peace to teach on. And I let you tell me what it is that you ask for, what you are struggling with, what you want to learn, what you want to know. So every year I do a, a series called You Asked For It for that purpose. And it never fails. Every single year there is the, the top prevailing theme that always surfaces and manifests itself as the most pressing question that the congregation and now even understanding that mankind has. And that is, what am I here for? What is my purpose? Uh, Rick Warren did a whole series and a, wrote a book called Purpose Driven Life. That became a New York Times bestseller and was translated into many different languages and has transcended all barriers around the world. He sold tens of millions of millions of copies of everything purpose driven because it is the number one question that plagues mankind's heart and mind. If you're mature, you ask it a different way. It's not what am I here for? It's not what is my purpose? If you're mature, this is how you ask it. God, what is your will for my life? You got to be pretty mature to ask that because, yeah, you know, when you pray that prayer, uh, 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 our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't think we ever understand what we're really saying. It's become so ritual that we don't have a relationship with the text or the words that we're, that we're speaking. When you say thy will be done, that means his will over your will. Okay, I'll do it a different way. That means his will over your wants. <laughs> his will over your own wishes. His will over what's comfortable and convenient. His will over what's popular. So when you say thy will be done, that is a magnificent prayer. A component of a magnificent prayer. And so I want you to make sure that you understand to, to be a mature believer... To pass and graduate to the ne next level, you have to be able to ask the purpose question a different way. Instead of what is my purpose, what am I here for, mm -mm. what is your will for my life? Because your purpose, I, I know every time I've ever heard this taught, people will say in order to find your purpose, just find what you're passionate about. The problem I have with that is that I'm passionate about some things that ain't, ain't in his will. Let me just leave that right there for a few minutes. It's some things that I love to do that I shouldn't be doing. As a matter of fact, some of you did it this week. Because you ate till you had to undo your pants at the table. But you're passionate about it. Well, maybe I'm a professional eater. Are y'all with me? The number one question should be, God, what is your will for my life? How can we tell the person who created us for his purpose what, our, what his will is or our purpose is for our lives? No, I have to ask him, seek him for wisdom, guidance, and direction and ask him, what is your purpose for my life? If that's your question, let me just see your hands. If that's your question, if, you, if you're ready to ask that question, because if you're not ready for the question, you ain't going to pass the class. Anybody ready for that question? Lord, show me your will. Show me your will. If that's your question, say it. Show me your will. Okay. He sent me with the answer. Stop listening to people's opinions and feelings for answers and start seeking out truth. 
Are you with me? There will be false prophets. There will be wolves in sheep's clothing. There will be false doctrine and false teaching. So what I need you to go for is truth. There is but one truth and it is the word of God. So there's a lot of people who tell you, well, I think you ought to be, I think you should be, I think you're going to be, I think this is what you should do, or you're really good at this, or you really seem to enjoy this. No, 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 I don't need your conjecture, your feelings, your thoughts, or your opinion. I want to know, God, what is your will for my life? Now, the manifestation of God's will will, will carry out in different ways. He, he puts, because it's a kingdom system, he puts different graces and different gifts in different vocational positions. But there's one foundational principle or one foundational truth that is the will of God for every single person who is a believer in Christ Jesus. It is his desire that every person would be saved and every person. God says, my, my desire is that none would be lost and all are saved. So he wants this to be everybody's desire or everybody's foundational principle because that's his will. But he especially is concerned about those who are in Christ Jesus, understanding and honoring his will. Please say amen if you're with me. No child left behind. Come closer. Lean in. Here's the answer to the test. This part of the test, this is your review. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Are y'all with me? It wasn't even hard, was it? I think y'all gonna pass this part of the test. It gets harder though, brace yourself. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus, concerning each and every one of us. In 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of gifts that are given goes through all of the list of the spiritual gifts, the gifts that are given, the graces and gifts that are given by God. And so uh, among, among that list, there are, two, there are two principles or practices that are missing. Uh, it doesn't mean that anything is missing from the word of God, and you'll understand it in a few seconds. But these spiritual gifts are the grace of God imparted into people's lives and capacity. You've heard it this way. They're just gifted. You with me? But there are some principles that need to be put into practice. They're not gifts, they're principles. And here they are. Prayer, that's one, one, that, that's one principle. You, you're not gifted to pray. You don't get the gift of prayer. You have the discipline of prayer. And that's why he made sure that you didn't feel like, ah, uh, if you don't pray like this. Yeah, if you don't call on the Lord with a specific cadence and timbre in your voice. Ah, Lord, hear our prayer and pity every groan. Lord. And you'll leave and somebody will say, my God, pastor can pray. He is gifted to pray. No, 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 no. God says, let me make sure that you understand. There are different translations. There are different presentations of this discipline. But at the core of it all, it's just a discipline. He says, just because you don't use lofty language. As a matter of fact, let me make sure you're clear. Don't babble as the pagans do. Don't use lofty language. And don't spit on me when you pray it. Oh, help us, Jesus. And then he goes on to say, and if you pray, pray like, like, not, not exact. He gave us a model. Pray like this. And he would get very simple. He says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So please understand uh, that, that prayer is a discipline. But here's the other thing that's a discipline. Praise. 
Let me tell you why I even have to address this today. Because when he says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord with my whole soul and all that is within me. I have to make sure you understand you don't get gifted to praise. Just because you grew up Pentecostal and you know how to shout does not mean you are gifted to praise. It means you can dance. Are you with me? And, and, and you're waiting on praise to just hit you. But praise is a discipline and disciplines are decided. You decide to pray. You decide to praise. You command your members to be obedient to your fault, which desires for you to pray and to praise. Is there anybody in here today? In other words, they are not naturally imparted upon you. I can't impart the grace of prayer on your life. I can't lay hands and say, I'm going to give you the gift of praise through impartation. No, you literally have to decide it's what you want and desire and will be obedient to do. Because it's not optional, it's commanded. There are disciplines that are given to you that are commands of God. And that means when you don't do them, you are disobedient or you're sinful. Help us, Jesus. First Corinthians talks about the spiritual gifts that God gives us. But watch this. Those gifts come through God's grace. It is God who imparts upon you the capacity to do these specific things, not your works and not and, and, and exclusively. It is the spirit and the power of God. Let me just talk about me for a minute. At five years old, I literally walked to a pit. Five. Somebody say five. I literally walked to a piano, sit down, pick out melodies, and teach. That's what I'm thinking. Teach myself how to play this piano. Don't miss it. At five. Jason, when did you start playing? At seven. The church didn't have a musician. They called Jason to the front. He says his, his, his father was his pastor. I, I need a musician. So they laid hands on his hands. And they prayed over his hands. And now he is one of the most gifted, prolific pianists and organists this side of heaven. That was the impartation of a gift. But watch this. Don't be, be very clear. It was not the bodily exercise which profited little. It was the agreement in faith so that God through grace could impart within him the gift that he has. You've heard it this way. They're just gifted. But there are things you were able to do and accomplish simply because of the grace of God. That's what your gift things or your gift is. And so it's not just singing. It's not just playing. It's not even just speaking in tongues. If we look at the spiritual gift things, it's not operating just in wisdom, operating in wisdom. It's not just interpreting tongues, but even the ability to produce wealth is a grace of God. God says, it is me who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so after that, however, let me tell you, once you realize the gift that you carry, once you materialize the gifting or the grace of God, which is not given through your works, it's given through the grace, the unmerited, undeserved, unearned goodness of God. No, nobody, nobody could have ever known. My mother and father, when they had me, did not know that they could, they could have a child, that would have a child rather that was five years old and could play the piano. There's no way that they birthed the child and said, this child is going to be a musician. No, it was God. And it's just marvelous in our eyes. And so, so understand that because you are gifted, that's one part of the equation. But gifted people come with testing. 
Because your gift and your calling comes without a relationship with God. Oh, this is good to me. Let me say it, let me say it according to the scripture. Gifts and calling come without repentance. Which simply means, even if you don't have a repentant heart that is turned towards God, you can still be gifted. So what God does is says, I've got to test your gifting or test your ability to carry this gifting by making sure you can handle, watch this, the glory that's going to come as a result of your gift. God tests you to see what you do with his glory that comes from the gift that has been given to you by his grace. He, he puts it to the test. He says, okay, now watch this. When I was about seven, eight years old, the family didn't know I could play the piano. I remember it like it was yesterday in my aunt's living room, the room that nobody could sit down on the sofa in. We would walk past that room and go to the other parts of the house, but you did not stop in that room. But in that room, my mother calls me in there one day. They had a piano in that room. She calls the whole family there. All her sisters are standing around. My cousins are standing there. And they say, you know, he can play the piano. They say, oh, okay, that's good. Because you know when a child, you know, seven years old, he's like, oh, that's so good, so sweet. But no, 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 no. I opened the lid. And I actually could play the piano. And I remember they were standing around in awe. Just, oh my God, that is so good. I mean, all the praise, all the celebration, all the accolades. My cousins dapping me up. I'm the big cuz now. It's a great moment. It's a moment of excitement, of passion. It's a moment of joy because they're praising me for my gift. They're giving me thanks and glory for my ability to play. <laughs> They're celebrating Smokey. This, that, he's so, he's amazing. He's incredible. He's anointed. He is gifted. I said, I am. I am all D, all of the above. That's me. And then I got ready to play at church and my mother and my father said, no. So, oh, but I can play. No, not yet. They had sense enough. Thank you, mom and dad. I appreciate y'all so much. They had sense enough to know that my gifting, my maturity hadn't caught up with my gifting. And I wasn't as good as I thought I actually was. So until my character was qualified to handle the praise, they put my gifting on pause so that I could prepare to carry the glory that he was going to reveal. Are you with me? God measures how you handle gifts and ultimately assesses what level of glory you can stand. His glory is weighty. It is heavy so if he puts too much glory and here's the problem there are so many people who think that they are the catalyst behind their gift until they need breath until sickness arrests their family or their own bodies until there's a circumstance that they don't have enough money to be able to fix until there's something that their fame, popularity, or the glory that they have amassed unto themselves cannot get them out of. God measures how you handle his gifts to assess whether or not you can handle the level of glory, watch this, that will come with elevation. He has to do this to see if, if he can not just not, if, not just if you can handle it, but he also wants to see if he can give you more. He says it like this. If you, are y'all still with me? If you're faithful over a few things, then I'll make you ruler over many. I need to see how you act when I give you a little. Because if you don't know how to praise me with a little, you ain't going to be no good to me. 
with a lot. So, here's, here's, the, here's the core of my lesson. And this is the final part of the review, and then you're going to have to take the test. The, the review goes like this. If you're going to qualify for God's elevation, his promotion, for advancement from this level into the next level, if you're going to commence and or graduate to the place that God desires for you to be. Because I need you to understand, his desire is not to fail anybody. He just can't let you get crushed under the weight of the glory that will happen if he puts you in a grave that you don't have capacity to navigate. Are y'all with me still? So, so, so watch this. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't just want you to stay at this level. But he says, I'm going to take you from glory to glory. It's not going to be enough for you to just have this level. That's why you got to be careful not to be complacent and remind yourself to praise God even in your pain because God is testing you. He is allowing certain things to happen to see if you can handle the level of glory. Please know that you are famous in hell. You are a celebrity. And the more favored, the more blessed, the more joy-filled, the more grace-carrying, the more merciful uh, mercy that you've received, the more abundance, you are famous to the demonic imps who want to take all of the glory off of you, strip you, and destroy you so that you no longer bring honor and glory and attention to the nemesis of Satan, which is God himself. So your, your name is already you, you keep trying to play yourself on social media You don't have to do that You're already famous They got you on a hit list If we do not stop this family they're going to create something in the earth that their bloodline will magnify, glorify, and praise God in a way that millions of people will be saved and they'll know who God is because of them. If we don't stop them now, they might walk in the break room and turn the whole break room into a prayer service. If we don't hit them with everything we have now, they might come out of this season and be a testimony and everybody else overcome the enemy because they see what God is capable of doing. If we don't stop this boy and put him in a situation where he can't sing, can't preach, and can't pray, and can't praise, he might open his mouth and something in the earth shift and an entire movement will be manifested that brings glory back to the one to whom it is due it is not by accident that you're going through what you're going through dealt with what you've dealt with been through what you've been through it's not by accident it's because God has his hand on you and the enemy is trying to strip you of the glory that God has invested inside of you but I I have made up my mind. No weapon. <laughs> no weapon formed against me shall ever be able to pry. Greater is he that is inside of me than the stuff that is happening around me and in my world. I am not just a conqueror. I am more than. I am on the top side of conquerors. I'm at the upper echelon of conquerors. I am victorious in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I know it's not I but it's Christ who is living inside. This ain't my gift. It's God's gift. This ain't my platform. This is God's platform. This ain't my pulpit. This is God's pulpit. This ain't my children. These are God's gifted children. This ain't my anointing. This is God's anointing. As a matter of fact, I ain't mine. I belong to him. Pop 
quiz. Give God what he deserves for what you know he has gifted, graced, favored, allowed you to do. Pop quiz. Don't you pass. Don't you fail. You better pass. You better tell him thank you. You better lift him up. You better give him glory. God is yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's your house, it's your house, ain't my house, I thank you for letting me live in it, thank you, the earth is the Lord's, it's your world, and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein, these are your clothes, thank you for letting me have them, this is your pen, thank you for letting me write powerful songs, this is your voice, thank you for letting me use it to bless nations, this is your child, thank you for loving me when I didn't know how to love myself. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Okay, sit down, sit down. I got to finish right quick. Oh, my goodness, I'm out of time. Can't let you leave because you can't fail. I got to give you this. Here's, here's, here's the will of God. Here's, here's the will of God. This is his instructions. Here's, here's the teaching. Here's the lesson. Here's the meat of the matter. Rejoice always. Come on, we're going to review for this. I gotta take you through this review. Rejoice how long? Always. always. In the original language, always means always. <laughs> always translates always. In the Hebrew and the Greek, always is always. That means with or without pressure, always. That means in the middle of it or with the absence of pain, always. That means with or without disappointment, always. Whether I get it and even if I don't, always. If, 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 if his will doesn't even align with my wants and my wishes, when I'm disappointed or when he surprises me with blessings and favor that I didn't even have room enough to receive, always. Whether they leave me or whether they stay. Whether I got to do it by myself or he sends me an army of people to help me. Rejoice always. See, God is looking for somebody he can trust. He, he wants to know, how, how much of my glory can you handle? Your opposition and your challenges that you face, they come to strengthen you. They strengthen your resolve. Watch this, but they also build your character. You think God is concerned about your content. God is concerned about your character. He will hold your content back until your character can handle what he has for you to hold. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you begging, Lord, I need you to bless me with this thing and that thing or this person or that person or this network, that job, this situation. Bless me with these things. He says, I can't give it to you yet because you don't have the character to handle it. If I put my keys in my son's hand and tell him to drive my car at 10 and 11 years old, I'm setting him up to destroy himself or somebody else along the way. I can't let him drive my car at 10 and 11 years old. I got to wait till he goes through the testing. And when he passes the testing and they give him a certification that qualifies him to be on the road, I can then let him use my car. But even then, I'm going to be riding over here with him for a little while. I need to be close enough to grab the wheel. As a matter of fact, I need, to, I need a break on my side. Your opposition and your challenges. See, see I used to train with a, a gentleman, his name was Kevin. And Kevin probably was one of the most proficient trainers because he was a kickboxer. He was a professional bodybuilder. His wife was a nutritionist. I mean, he had all the components and he understood muscular structure. He literally could break down the components of my body and tell me what tendons were. I mean, he knew everything that anybody could know. And he was an incredible trainer. 
uh, 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 but he would always train me. And, and as incredible as he was as a trainer, uh, he was also my, my, my worst enemy. Uh, because he wasn't trying to break me, he was trying to make me, but he would always train me to the place or the point of exhaustion. And I couldn't understand it. It's like, dude, I have had enough. I'm done. He said, no, no, no. Come on, give me three more. And I would always ask him before we start, how many of these I need to do? When we get in here, good. How many of these? Okay, this is what you're going to do. This is the exercise. I want you to do this. We're going to do seated rows. I want you to... How many? Because I wanted to hold him accountable for the number he gave me. But Kevin would never give me a number. He would just say, we're just going to do a few of them. Which was a setup. That meant, we're just going to do enough until you can't do no more. He would always get me to a point of breaking because he wanted to tear the muscle fiber. When he told me that, well, every time you're doing this exercise, the reason you're sore the next few days is because the muscle fiber has been torn. I said, so you messing stuff up. He said, no, but you got to understand that every time it grows back together, it grows back stronger and it gets bigger. So every time I put you through the rigor and every time I tear the muscle fiber, when it grows back together, when it connects, when it heals, then you will be better than you were the first time. And so he would always know what my breaking point was. And I'm like, how do you know when enough is enough? He said, because of how you respond. <laughs> Once I started to lament and complain, that's about the time he would be ready to stop. He said, okay, that's enough. It's like, no, nah, man, I can't do this. He says, okay, that's enough. But, but what it also meant is that that, that was also the stopping point or the limitation of my gains. If I couldn't press through the pain, then I wouldn't experience the gains. Are you with me? So the character of my muscles stayed at the level of the threshold for my own pain. So when I could take more, then I would get more, more, more strength, more resistance, more, more, more ability. I, I would get more endurance, more perseverance. But he built me up to the place where what used to cause me to tremble. Now I'm saying stack some more on there. That ain't enough because I had built my character, the character of my muscle structure to a place where even, watch it, I sent a picture of my back to my father. I literally text him and he said, who is that? I said, that's me. He said, boy, quit playing with me. Don't get on my phone. You quit lying. He wouldn't believe me because the character of my muscles had increased so much that I didn't look like I used to look. I didn't lift like I used to lift. I didn't do like I used to do. I didn't collapse like I used to collapse. So I'm trying to get you to understand that what you want is on the other side of your pain and discomfort. What you need is on the other side of your disappointment and your disadvantages. What you want is the building of your character which comes with the weightiness of pressure and pain that's testing you for your next level. Let me tell you why you want it. Because character determines how much you can carry. If you don't have character, you can't carry it. So here's what God wants to know. And, and, and are y'all still with me? God wants to know this. He says, I want to know, are you thankful? Do you have a thankful heart? Because it doesn't come from impartation. It comes from a decision. You decide to be thankful. No, no, it's not a feeling. I got to correct something. I've been saying this all month long. And when I started doing this study, I convicted myself. So I need to make sure I correct something for you. There is no such thing as an attitude of gratitude. I, I'm going to let that sit for a second because I've been preaching it. You got to have an attitude of gratitude. No, th that's not it. You got to have a decision for gratitude. 
Because to rejoice always means you don't always feel like rejoicing. Can we just, can we just be honest about it? Okay, let me give you this example. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I, you know, pray for me, pray for your pastor. I have a touch of road rage, but God is delivering me slowly. I can't stand for somebody to get in front of me, and I'm in a hurry. And they're going super, super slow. Or oh, when they put their blink on and they turn, and it take them 30 minutes to turn. Just turn your car. You breaking my stride. Now I got to slam on my brakes and almost hit you because you taking three hours to turn the corner. I have to command myself because I don't feel like rejoicing right then. I have to command myself, "Uh uh-uh, rejoice, uh -uh, always. Rejoice, always. It's impossible to complain when you are more concerned with the goodness of God than you are the problem. When you start thinking, God, Lord, I just thank you that I have this nice car. I remember when I had to roll my window down like this. I thank you that I, the, the, the stuff in the liner is not falling down in my head again. Thank you that I ain't got to stop at a stoplight and press the gas to make sure that it don't cut off before my carburetor goes bad. I thank you that I don't have to get out and put a screwdriver in my carburetor at the light to make sure that everything is still running. I thank you that if I start going down the list, I know I just said I caught a whole lot of stuff that only the old school saints is going to really, really understand. But if you grew up when I grew up, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Thank God that I ain't got to get out and wax my car with oxidation on the hood and try to play like it's a Rolls Royce. Thank God I don't have to sit there and go to the gas station and say, can you give me $2 on pump one? Thank God that I ain't in the same... <laughs> only the real folks know how to be thankful right there. So when I start going down that list, I really don't care that you're driving slow in front of me. I don't care that you got in front of me and slowed down. As a matter of fact, cruise, look in your rear mirror, check out my bumper. It looks real nice. I got a big grill on here. Thanks be to God. It's hard to complain when you're thinking about the goodness of God and when it's the most pressing priority. Okay, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Pray and don't stop. Philippians 4, 6 says this, make your supplication known unto God. Be anxious for nothing, but make your supplication known unto God. With thanksgiving. That's the one we miss. We say, make your request known unto the Lord. No, no, we skip right over with thanksgiving. We pray to bring about change, but we don't see the change because many of us don't pray with thanksgiving. We pray out of a hole. We pray out of a place of desperation. There's nothing wrong with being desperate for God, but you tend to not pray with authority. When you pray out of a place of desperation instead of, Lord, I thank you that it's already working out. Lord, I thank you that this thing is turning around for my good. I thank you that it's already happening for me. Thank you that I'm going to get the job. Thank you that if this is not the right job, you're going to give me the one that I need. Thank you that the house belongs to me. Thank you that my dreams are going to be manifested. Thank you that my children are going to be saved. Thank you that my people are going to be blessed. Thank you that my, my grandchildren are... I, I, can't, I can't pray out of a place, Lord, please, 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 Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, because I'm going to change the posture of my prayer. And when I change the posture of my prayer into a place of thanksgiving, it gives God confidence. It gives God evidence, rather, of my confidence. I ain't praying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No, I know that 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 I know. I know who he is, I know whose I am, I know what he's capable of doing, and I know he will. Thankfulness helps to keep your prayer on target. In everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, what? Okay, how do I give thanks when the stuff ain't good? My father's favorite hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. See, what I figured out is it doesn't have to be okay for it to be well. It ain't good, but it is well. I ain't there yet, but it is well. How do I thank God for my problems? In everything, give thanks. How do I thank God for my problems? Okay, 
Let me help you out. We're not thanking God for the problems list. We're thanking God for what's not on the blessing list or what's not on rather the problems list. Are you with me? Let me say it again because I want, I want you to miss it. We're not thanking God for the problems that are on the list. We are thanking God for the problems that are not on the list. Because as bad as you think it is. Oh, it's a whole lot of people that would love. They would love your hand. They would pray for your problems only. They would, they would scoot, roll, and crawl into your problems and say, Lord, I thank you. So you're not thanking God for the problems that are on your list. You thank God, that the, the, you thank God for the problems that didn't make your list. When you pray from a place of pain and problems, you change the, your, your posture of your prayer. And you pray yourself out of a hole instead of in a place of authority and out of a heavenly place. You were not made it to be seated in low places, but you were made it to be seated in high places in Christ Jesus. So playing out of a place of desperation is not the thing. I've got to pray from a place that I say, God, I hear it is. I know who you are. I know what you're able to do. So I thank you that it's already done. And then he wants to know, do you really trust me? In other words, when I don't do it, when and how you want me to do it, can you really still rejoice always? In everything, will you still give me thanks? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Here's your test. This is the final exam. Take everything off of your, paper, your desk except for a pen and paper. You don't even need a calculator for this. This is your final exam. In the scripture, and I'm not going to go there and read the whole thing. In Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, I want you to read it at your convenience. In Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, it's a commencement address. It's literally a commencement address. They're about to embark upon a new season, new territory. And this is the instructions that he gives. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. When you come out of Thanksgiving holiday, in verse 11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving to you on this day. In verse 12, otherwise, when you, are, when you eat and are satisfied, when your bank account is good, when you're full, when you're in a favorite season, when you build your fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks and your stocks grow large, and your silver and your gold increase. And all you have now has been multiplied. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast dreadful wilderness. That thirsty waterless land when its venomous snakes and scorpions tried to consume you. He brought you water out of a rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something that your ancestors had never even seen before. He did it to humble and to test you to, so that in the end, it might go well with you. So the last questions on your test is simply this, thankfulness. You can't be trusted with praise until he can trust you with criticism. You can't be trusted in increase until you learn how to trust him in loss. He can't trust you with loyal friends until you know how to trust him in betrayal. You can't be trusted in pain until you learn how to trust him for his promise. So the question that I have, and this is the final part of the, the test. Now that you've remembered now that you've rehearsed and responded, and now that you know your responsibility, this is it. Ain't by me. What you gonna do with it?
It's not about me. I don't, you waiting on me. It's not about me. This is to see if you're ready to handle what he has for you to hold. Well, how will he know? How will he know that I'm ready? Because you, nobody has to push you to praise him. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts. Nobody got to remind you how good he is. Nobody has to push you, pump you. You don't need the praise team. You don't need the drums, the organ. You don't need any of that. You just praise him on GP. You know, you praise him just because. Yeah, general principle alone, you just praise him because you know, nobody has to remind you that he gave you breath, health, strength, activity. He'll know you're ready to handle it when you become a praiser. When you learn how to bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Last chance. This is an extra credit. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.